Okay, then let's start the lecture number five on manufacturing of metal metric composites. So here is the content or the overview for the lecture. So I'm going to look at uh, the uh, some uh, basic uh, details relating to the metal metric composites, some possible uh, the reinforcement materials, and also uh, the uh, potential uh, the matrix materials and uh, the type of applications and so on. And then uh, the uh, number of uh, the manufacturing techniques very briefly. Uh, and also we can look at some of the possible applications uh, for metal metric composites. The metals are also one of the most important materials that we are using for many years now. Without metal, the, the, this world would not be like this uh, today, right? So then the metals are that important. Uh, so although we are just talking about the specific strength of polymers or composites, so metals are also really important. So we have to have metals for some particular applications, right? Without metals, so industrial revolution or industrial applications, the manufacturing vehicles, bridges, all the other structures would not be possible. Therefore, we can understand that how important the metal for our day-to-day -day life and also for the global economy and so on. So therefore, uh, the, we just discuss about metals, the metallic alloys, and also now we're going to look at uh, the metal metric composites uh, to extend our boundaries of using metallic material. So by just manufacturing uh, the metallic metric composites of, same as the other type of composites uh, by just manufacturing a metal metric composites we can push the boundaries of the use of a metallic material in different applications okay so by manufacturing metal metric composite we might use uh, the, the uh, these materials in some high temperatures or maybe in some extreme conditions and so on okay so that is the idea okay let's look into this process and then how we can just uh, manufacture metal metric composites and what are the important considerations and applications for metal metric composites uh okay and some of the books again you can uh, the refer to uh so one of the books written here by the uh, the field with us uh, if you want to uh, read that introduction to metal matrix composites it's a, it's a really nice book right so i hope you have done this uh, the what you call uh, the metal metallurgy in your undergraduate degrees right if i ask how many how many pure elements we have discovered so far 118 but well, still not uh, completed yet so then out of these 118 elements so 94 of them are natural okay 94 of them are natural that means they, they just occurs naturally on the earth 24 of them are uh, just uh, the synthetic or we just uh, the uh, manufacture them art artificially 118 uh, elements so far but there will be more okay 118 and then 94 of these are just natural elements and then of these again the other rest is just is 24 just artificial so then but most of these are not stable that means they are decaying uh, with the half life and some of these also quite a few not is not stable so they they decays uh, with the half life but with million years okay so then but of all of these uh, if you look at the periodic table here now from all of these 118 elements, majority of them are metals. Okay, so the, that is the main thing. So most of them are metals, or there are different categories of the metals. Right, okay, so different categories of the metals here. But they are mostly solid. I'm not going to discuss that. Uh, the, and then malleable, one of the materials invented very early, uh, the stages of the, uh, the uh, civilization. Okay, conduct electricity and but here, so the, for the metals, we discussed two main types. You might have learned, it's a quick recap. So we call uh, the substitutional alloys. If you consider the alloys and metals, we mostly now use alloys. Okay, we mostly now use alloys. We have two types, uh, the substitutional alloys and uh, the interstitial alloys. Okay, you can see the difference here. So replace one of the atoms of the base material, the base material is uh, the black one here you could say, but the alloying element or alloying agent replace some particular atoms, but they are in the same size. Okay, so by in the interstitial alloys, so you could say, so it is just not replacing the, the main atom of the base material, but it's just <coughs> between the, uh, the uh, structure, you will get some small size of uh, the alloying agent, and uh, these are the two main type of uh, the alloying uh, uh, the methods or create manufacturing alloys, substitutional and interstitial alloys. Right, uh, the, some example here, uh, copper and zinc, so we brass, this is a 
substitutional alloy. And uh, we have done these phase diagrams. I hope you were familiar with them. Right. Uh, the not, uh, one example for the interstitial alloy is the, uh, the carbon ion. So a small, uh, the carbon atoms could be with the, uh, these iron or the ferrous atoms and then it is a kind of uh, the example for the interstitial alloy. Okay, then moving into the uh, metal matrix composites. Here also the idea is just to, we have monolithic materials, that means monolithic means with a single chemical compound. So those metals may have single chemical compound but we try to mix with some reinforcing agents to get the desired properties. So that is what we are trying to do here as well. The concept of the composite is same for PMCs, CMCs or MMCs. Uh, the most commonly used uh, the uh, matrix materials, aluminium, magnesium and then titanium. The aluminium is the most dominant matrix material for the, uh, the metal matrix composites. Okay, and in high temperature applications, not as good as uh, ceramics, but cobalt and cobalt nickel, al nickel alloys can be used. Okay, some of the examples for the uh, possible uh, short or long fiber reinforcements, uh, mostly for the metal matrix, we use short fibers, uh, particles. Okay, and then uh, the long fibers are possible, but uh, the most uh, popular is the mostly popular is the short fibers or particle reinforcements. So uh, the, we can discuss them into four, four different categories based on the reinforcement, uh, the monofilaments or the kind of long fibers and whiskers or short fibers and particles and also it could be wires. Okay, so we'll discuss them, uh, the uh, different classifications based on the type of the reinforcement. Right, uh, the, as I mentioned, these are the main matrix, uh, the aluminium matrix uh, the, is the most commonly used and uh, the type of applications and then magnesium matrix, magnesium matrix uh, is the, why we use them is the lightweight is also one of the, uh, the uh, advantage of magnesium compared to aluminium. Uh, titanium and copper and super alloys, so these are the most commonly used. Uh, the uh, MSC systems and okay Pla factors influencing the, uh, the properties of metal matrix composite uh, properties depends on the volume fractions of the reinforcement and matrix as we know and also uh, the form of the uh, the reinforcement particles short fibers or long fibers okay and the nature of the matrix uh, we can select high temperature or uh, low dense matrix. Uh, so there are several other things that you have to consider, considering the properties of the uh, the metal matrix composites. So some comparison of the uh, metal matrix composites. Okay, here we have the polymers. Okay, polymer matrix composites. But okay, the metals are also in the same level, but uh, the specific modulus here, so a bit higher for the metal matrix composites if you compare with uh, the polymers. Okay, so but in some places polymers we can't apply because of the temperature requirements. Okay, so uh, we have to get, you know, the, uh, these three types, they have different uh, the characteristics. We, you engineers to select the best material to be replaced or used in some applications. And uh, another important uh, the, uh, property in uh, manufacturing industry is the thermal expansion. How good it uh, with the temperatures, whether it will expand or dissolve or what, what will happen, melt. So then if you get monolithic, monolithic materials like magnesium, aluminium, so they are a bit not that great in uh, uh, withstanding in high temperatures, so but uh, the systems, uh, the met metal matrix composite systems are good in uh, high temperature applications with lower thermal expansion coefficients. Okay, and uh, then uh, Strength-wise, so these aluminium, boron, metal matrix composites, and the com some car comparison of the different uh, systems, uh, they are just good at uh, the, the strength as well. And uh, the reinforcement, so uh, you asked about uh, the volume fraction to be used. So th this is uh, the example you can see what will happen with the volume fraction. 
just with the aluminium and if you try to increase uh, the add some silicon carbide to alumina so you can see what will happen to the the Young's modulus okay so and also here comparison here is just here you can see aluminium with uh, the silicon carbide 50 percent 30 percent and then you have to play with this volume fraction to get the desired uh, the Young's modulus or the strength okay so this is something you should uh, figure out through experiments. So what are the effects of the factors like temperature, processing temperature, volume fraction of the reinforcement and maybe uh, the type of the or the form of the reinforcement that we are going to use. Of course having more reinforcement means it is going to be expensive. Okay, So then you just try to uh, figure out the properties required and then what is the volume fraction you need uh, for the composite material. Because Okay, then here you can see that the effect of the volume fraction of the, the reinforcement material uh, towards the strength or the Young's modulus of the metal metric composite material. So as we discussed before, mostly in composites, we manufacture the, the composite material uh, during the production of the product actually. But so this could be mostly uh, the true for the polyometric composites, but however, for metal metric composites maybe, so you might have just manufacture the, the metal metric composites uh, and then we use the material for different applications. So compared to the polymetric composites, we might not have the same kind of flexibility with the metal metric composites because so then we just try to mix uh, the, the reinforcements and then we just manufacture the, the matrix materials and then we have to take it uh, the afterwards for machining, grinding, and then get into the desired shape. However, if you manufacture a final product using metal metric composites, you will have the flexibility to uh, control the, the uh, required uh, the, the uh, reinforcement and the, the matrix ratio as we needed. But okay, so here you have to understand that the selection of the reinforcement and the, the matrix material is really critical for any type of uh, the, the uh, composite material actually. Okay, so and also you have to decide whether we have to go with uh, the, the particles, powders or long fibers. So these are the things that we have to consider. Right here, there's another comparison between the specific strength and the temperature. You could see that here, the aluminum metal matrix composite, which is one of the, uh, the commonly used metal matrix composite material, I have in very high strength, but however, so it might not uh, the go beyond uh, temperatures like uh, the 800 degrees or so. But uh, the, some of the, the uh, metal metric composites, the carbon carbon and the refractory metals and so on, so they might uh, the go for higher temperatures like uh, the 300 Fahrenheit and so on. Here you can understand the constraints or the limitations that we have with different type of uh, the composite materials. However, for some particular applications, so then we don't have any other choice. So we have to go with the more suitable material. So it, it could be polymers or it could be metal or ceramics. So therefore, uh, the all types of the composite materials are important uh, for different type of applications. But however, if we have the choice to select uh, the more suitable uh, material among these types, so then we might go with the best material with the highest specific strength uh, and so on. Uh, when we select the material, most uh, the critical thing to be considered is the, the sustainability or the specific fuel consumption uh, and the other environmental impact that we have nowadays. So therefore, uh, that is really important. We have, we have to check whether we can cut down the carbon footprint or whether the material can be recycled after use or what would be the service life. And uh, likewise, so we have to consider those factors. Uh, then uh, the nowadays we have to go for eco-friendly structures. So that is the main constraint. And with the composite material also, we have to just uh, go with that route. So then we have to follow the circular economy concept uh, in all the manufacturing fields if you want to just uh, the, uh, the, uh, tackle the, the ongoing, uh, the alarming issues such as uh, the climate change uh, the, and also uh, the global warming and so on. Okay, so then uh, the, as you all know, composite materials are playing a vital role in a number of different areas, but however, few decades before, the metal was the most, uh, the, the critical material that we use in most of the applications where our strength is needed. Okay. Especially in the aerospace industry, so few decades before we use aluminium, aluminium matrix composites, titanium, uh, titanium uh, matrix composites and so on. Nowadays, we try to replace the, the most of the metallic uh, the material with some uh, the polyometrics or uh, the ceramic metric composite materials. But however, we should understand that. So uh, the, a few decades back, uh, the metal was the most critical material in most of these applications.
Here, there's a nice video to explain the evolution of composite material uh, within the aerospace industry over the past uh, few decades, actually. So then uh, the initially we used wood sometimes, but then after that gradually we moved into uh, the metals, metal metric composites. So nowadays we are trying to use uh, the, some uh, the uh, composite materials uh, with high specific strength and trying to replace some of the metallic material with uh, the, the uh, advanced, uh, the uh, polymetric composites and ceramic metric composites, which are having a high specific strength. So, but the metal was one of the key component or key materials that we used uh, in the aerospace industry, even today. So then we have some critical applications like aircraft landing gear and uh, the several other places we still use metals because we cannot replace uh, those uh, components with a normal or uh, advanced uh, the polymetric or ceramic metric composites. Okay, so then uh, this should be a nice video for you to understand the evolution of the uh, the composites within the aerospace industry. Wait. It's always been a critical factor in aviation. The heavier the craft, the more power and lift you need, and the more fuel you consume. Nowadays, we can use advanced composite materials to build lighter, faster, more durable aircraft. But it was a lot tougher in the beginning. The earliest heavier-than-air flying machines were made of the lightest materials available usually wood for the frame and a cloth cover. With a few variations, the model persisted for many years. Then, following the First World War, aluminum became the material of choice, and several all-metal craft were produced over the next decade. But the shortcomings of aluminum soon became apparent. It was hard to form it into smooth and complex shapes, it was subject to corrosion, and aluminum became fatigued when worked or stressed. Slowly, many of these problems were addressed. New alloys were developed, and airframes were built with complex and expensive structural reinforcement. By the 1930s, wood had virtually disappeared from American multi-passenger and military aircraft. Even as the fortunes of aluminum soared, composites were making inroads into aviation. Modern composites rely on a matrix that can be molded into shapes. That actually happened back in 1907 with the invention of Bakelite, a liquid phenolic resin. In early applications, Bakelite was combined with weak reinforcements such as sawdust, paper, or cloth. These phenolic resin composites had some serious limitations. They were relatively weak and brittle. The first uses of Bakelite in aviation would have been for small parts like insulators and control knobs inside the craft. Then, in 1930, Owens Corning developed fiberglass composites. Early fiberglass still used phenolic resin, so the composites were still brittle, but they were quite strong. This strong and moldable fiberglass was not suitable for aircraft parts, but it was perfect for creating parts. Douglas Aircraft Company used fiberglass composites as forming die tools to produce prototype metal aircraft parts, and much of the industry followed. The approach of World War II saw several advances in material science, including polymer chemistry, new synthetic resins, including polyester resin and epoxy resin, eliminated the brittle matrix problem. This new generation of composites was ready to fly. The war years saw composites spread throughout military craft. Fiberglass air ducts, engine covers called nacelles, and radomes to protect delicate radar electronics. Wartime metal shortages gave the composites industry another boost as the U.S. government began ordering new training aircraft with composite airframes. Fifteen years later, the war was long over, 
but global pressures were building. The Cold War and the space race were hungry for new technology, and new technology demanded new materials. A breakthrough came in the early 1960s when fiber was produced from boron metal. With the addition of an epoxy resin matrix, this boron epoxy composite was the first ACM, Advanced Composite Material. Because of its expense, boron fiber composites have seen limited use, almost entirely in military applications, including the horizontal stabilizer of the F-14 Tomcat and the primary structural member of the B-1 bomber. Another ACM developed in the 1960s was carbon fiber composites. Carbon fiber is stronger and lighter than fiberglass and much less expensive than boron fiber. It was a perfect fit for both military and commercial aviation. Carbon fiber composites have been used extensively for internal structural parts and exterior skins in the F-117 stealth fighter and the B-2 stealth bomber. In commercial aviation, both the Boeing 787 and the Airbus A350XWB use carbon fiber ACMs for over 50% of each craft's structure. Another reinforcing fiber that's currently used in aerospace applications is aramid. The best known aramid, Kevlar, comes from a family of fibers that can absorb and dissipate an enormous amount of energy. Aramid composites are often used for impact protection, light armor, and to reinforce helicopter rotor blades. Composites are made for aviation, literally. They are the perfect designer material for an industry that is ever-changing, ever-seeking new challenges. Light, strong, stable, flexible, chemical resistant, heat resistant, shock resistant, even bulletproof. In aerospace, if it can be dreamed, it can be built. Thanks to composite technology. Okay, I think it was a really nice demonstration uh, the, how the, the composite, uh, the material was just uh, the uh, evolved through the aviation industry. So then we can see that uh, the gradually the metallic materials were replaced uh, the, the, uh, within this industry. But however, so as I mentioned before, so the metals and metal metric composites are still used uh, in aviation industry in a number of uh, different applications. Okay. So therefore, uh, we cannot just uh, the, uh, the assume or consider that uh, the metallic metric composites are not that important uh, as the, the ceramic matrix or polymetric composites, right? So then uh, the, this is all I want to discuss uh, uh, on basics uh, of the, the metal metric composites. I hope you got some good understanding on the, some of the common matrix materials that we can use and also reinforcements and also different type of composite systems as well. So then we can look at some basics relating to the manufacturing of metal metric composites.